Hello again. I'm Vince Cipolla, president of MAS. Okay, so the MAS summit was the number six most tweeted hashtag in the USA. That's true, half an hour ago. So, but we're slipping, probably because like Nicki Minaj and Katy Perry got, got up, got out of bed, or Kim Kardashian, any of those other big, you know, people. Kim Kardashian woke up, she probably hasn't, she's not up yet. Um, okay. Now I have the honor of introducing our next speaker, Michael Kimmelman of the New York Times, an individual whose career and canon represent journalism at its finest. Earlier this year, we had the pleasure of rec recognizing Michael's incredible contributions to New York's architectural environment with MAS's Brendan Gill Prize, an award named for longtime New Yorker theater and architecture critic, champion preservationist, and civic booster Brendan Gill, and presented annually to the creator of a building, book, essay, musical composition, play, film, painting, sculpture, dance, or design that best captures the energy, vigor, and verve of our incomparable city. It was Michael's exceptional coverage of the challenges posed by an overstressed Penn Station that inspired New Yorkers to no longer settle for anything less than planning and design excellence at this gateway to our city. It was the thoughtfulness and quality of that work, along with reporting and essays so eloquently describing and analyzing the community impacts of design and development, both here and in other cities, that earned Michael the recognition of the Gill Prize jury in 2014. Before his appointment as architecture critic at the Times, Michael reported insightfully on urban issues from Berlin, Cairo, Medellin, Paris, Rio, Istanbul, and London, in addition to New York City. He is the best kind of critic, an author who believes we can do better and whose writing makes us believe we can as well. New York Magazine named him the People's Critic, and we couldn't agree more. Please welcome Michael Kimmelman. <laughs> Uh, good morning, and th thank you for that wonderful introduction. And I'm really happy to be here. Um, so I want to speak um, about public space as an incubator of social and economic progress, and um, a report on a few cases I've come across in the Middle East. Um, my hope is to give a little perspective on our city, where I suspect we can agree that the most dramatic change during the last 30 years or so has involved the public realm, the transformation of parks, uh, plazas, uh, streets, uh, subways, and the waterfront. Um, a young generation now in the workforce gravitating to cities, riding bikes, not owning cars, or in many cases not even getting driver's licenses, uh, prizing density, uh, not looking to escape it, and concerned about resilience. It's a generation pushing for change, and this is the generation that occupied Zuccotti Park and Taksim Square, and has been taking to the streets of Hong Kong. I will first state the obvious, that officials Architects and planners design public spaces to serve certain functions or prevent others. This is itself a political act. But then what happens when people use the spaces that other politics are enacted? It is this enactment by changing configurations of bodies and interests within the space that makes architecture inseparable from politics. Hannah Arendt said that the political action the political action requires a space of appearances, while a true polis is the organization of the people as it arises out of acting and speaking together. That is, a polis expresses itself through the interaction of people in a place. It is at once the people and the place. A Turk told me during the protests in Istanbul last year that the Turkish people who have taken over Gezi Park in protest feel it is truly theirs, not something awarded to them by their leaders. This is critical. The notion of top-down versus bottom-up public space, spaces people are given and passively use versus spaces they remake for themselves over which they feel ownership. The question is, who controls these spaces, shapes them, and what do their physical properties say about us as a democracy. So my first example I want to give you is from Cairo, in addition to the Ring Road Highway, uh, made by residents of Arda Aliwa, a neighborhood bordering that highway. The highway is a project of Hosni Mubarak and part of Cairo's 
disastrous exurbanization, which insulated many wealthy Egyptians behind the walls of gated communities on the city's outskirts. Um, the proliferation of gated communities is a global phenomenon. I won't go into it now, but uh, you can see what the effects are around the world. This is outside Cairo, a place called Katamia Heights. Um, and that is indeed right outside Cairo. You can imagine what that means for the environment. Um, and, and uh, you know, th this is also akin to the enclosures, I think, of agricultural land during the 17th century, which did away with the commons, the same idea. The trend is accelerating, and you can see its effect in Cairo, um, not just at Katamia. Um, in addition to the ring road, uh, Mubarak also commissioned the 6th of October bridge, uh, linking um, uh, Tahrir Square, or the downtown commercial district, with affluent suburbs like Nasser City and New Cairo. You know, there are, I think, 14% of the population owns cars out of uh, uh, 20 million, but Mubarak envisioned modern Cairo as a kind of Middle Eastern version of post-war America with all these freeways. So you can imagine that it was natural. The 6th of October bridge became a site of violent clashes uh, during the revolution there. But something more uh, interesting, I think, and dramatic happened after Mubarak's fall and during um, the purgatory, you might call it, of, of Morsi's aborted rule. Post-revolution, Kyrenes, whose neighborhoods had been ignored by Mubarak and bypassed by the highways, constructed their own public spaces. In Imbebe, which is a neighborhood sometimes called the Islamic Republic of Imbebe, with a population uh, larger than Manhattan's. I think it's important to understand how large these uh, communities are. Um, neighborhood coalitions came together and started to fix their own roads up. They started to collect trash and create public squares, police the streets. May al Ibrashi is an Egyptian architect I met over there who was talking about the sort of guerrilla urbanism in Cairo that happened you know, before this military takeover. And she told me what definitely changed was that before in Cairo, someone always used to dictate where you were allowed to sit and walk, what you were allowed to do or say. The street was not really public space. For a while after Mubarak, almost by default, it was. And I saw this nowhere more clearly illustrated than on the Ring Road, built specifically to bypass and thereby isolate Ard Aliwa, which, like Imbebe, is an immense informal settlement. For years, workers, government workers, many of them living there, had to waste hours each day getting downtown to their jobs because they couldn't take the road. So in the absence of either help or interference by Morsi's government, residents consult, uh, constructed on their own um, on and off ramps to the highway. <laughs> That's right. They built these ramps out of dirt and sand and trash, and then they invited the police to open a kiosk at the interchange. This was full-on do-it-yourself infrastructure. It was kind of a massive assertion of public authority over public space and an implicit rejection, obviously, of exclusionary politics. Omar Nagati is an Egyptian architect and planner who said to me before the takeover by the military, the Arab Spring was always a revolution about unjust urban conditions and about public space. The ramp is just one example. Pe people realized that they had the right to determine what happens on their own streets to their own neighborhoods so there erupted a battle of ownership throughout Egypt over whose space this is and who determines whose space this is. That was all Omar. The second example I want to give you of this kind of ground up public space comes from the Syrian refugee col camp called Zatari, which a year ago or so, some of you may remember, was regarded as one of the most desperate and dangerous places on earth and is now uh, becoming an informal city. Um, a de facto do-it-yourself metropolis of about 85,000 people with the emergence of neighborhoods, gentrification, a booming economy, and under the circumstances, something approaching normalcy. I was there uh, just a few months ago. The change illustrates, I think, a basic civilizing push toward urbanization that clearly happens even in desperate places, people leaving their stamp wherever they make, uh, wherever they live and making spaces they occupy their own. And it illustrates the particular drive to make and occupy public space, places shared and civilizing. Organic development is unstoppable, as one architect who works at Zatari told me. Whether you encourage growth in the right ways or you fight it, it's going to happen anyway. Public space in Zatari was not regarded by residents as an amenity but a necessity, a basic human need. So refugees on their own created what is a kind of de facto souk along the main road. This is a private supermarket that opened in the refugee camp. 
uh, and uh, along this main road, which is called the Champs Elysees by the uh, officials in Zatry. <laughs> And out of, that, out of that boom has arisen a kind of modicum of safety, self-governance, and tremendous economic growth. This is one of the largest, most booming places in the entire Middle East. I'm not kidding, the Zatari refugee camp. The creation of this public realm, in other words, has led to the rudiments of a civil society. Look, I don't want to overstate the case at Zatari. It's also a place of last resort for thousands of displaced families. But it points, among other things, to the transformative power of public space. My last example comes from another very different, much older camp established in 1950 called Fawar in the Southern West Bank, where I was some weeks ago. Two architects, a Palestinian and an Italian couple based in Bethlehem, Sandy Hilal and Alessandro Petti, worked with residents of, uh, of the camp in Fawar to create a public plaza, unheard of, in Palestinian refugee camps in the West Bank, and a deeply controversial concept among Palestinian refugees for whom the creation of any permanent amenity by implying normalcy undermines their fundamental self-image as temporary occupants with the right of return to Israel. We see from this plaza in Fawar, uh, as with Satri in Cairo, that the notion of being in public is a behavioral, not just a spatial condition, which nonetheless depends on certain spatial aspects. You know, in refugee camps, there's no public and private, conceptually. Um, property is not private in camps, and refugees don't own their homes, nor are the streets municipal properties as they are in cities, because refugees are not citizens, and the camp is not a city. The legal notion of a refugee camp, according to the UN, is in effect a temporary site for displaced stateless individuals, not a civic body. But there is a powerful sense of community across multiple generations and in a deeply conservative place like Fawar. So six years ago, Petty and Halal began a conversation with residents about creating a public square or plaza. Many of the residents were very suspicious, not just about normalizing the camp, but about creating a space where men and women might come together in public. The question was how a space could be made open so men, women, and children could gather while allowing the women, when they chose to meet each other, some enclosure. They didn't want to feel exposed. It was decided that the space, a site about 50 by 100 meters, where there had been three disused shelters from the 50s, should be enclosed by a low concrete wall, making, in effect, a stone courtyard or a house without a roof. Now, women gather there every week uh, to talk, study English. They weave and sell what they make. Um, while the children have a place to play other than in the streets. The square has opened up very profound conversations inside the camp about the role of women, permanence, the right of return, ownership, and home. Back here in New York, I suspect what many politicians and private developers took away from the Occupy movement was that in future, they need to work harder to design spaces that can't be occupied. And in fact, many new rules have been established in privately owned public spaces uh, to prevent just that. But I think another lesson is that millions of people dream of opportunity and equality, and that those dreams will continue to be contested and expressed in the public spaces we build for each other and ourselves. For war, Zatari, Ardeliwe may seem as far from New York as you can get, but our great city, like those places, wrestles with questions of inequity, opportunity, resilience. In Zatari or Fawar or Ardeliwa, I couldn't help but feel, <clears throat> you know, for want of a better word, what is the blessing and privilege of life in New York, which I think obliges us as New Yorkers to make the most of our situation, to improve what ails us as a city and point the way toward a greater and even more ideal metropolis. The de Blasio administration has lately outlined its plan to spend uh, $130 million, 80 million of it, one has to say, already set aside by the Bloomberg administration, to repair 35 small neglected neighborhood parks uh, in low-income areas around the city. And Vision Zero, as you may know, is the mayor's campaign to eliminate traffic deaths, which among other things involved lowering the speed limit to 25 miles an hour and redesigning some of New York's more dangerous arterials and intersections. These are good ideas as far as they go. But I hope we aim much higher and that this administration shows much more interest in the built city. As I said, I believe there is a generational shift underway. I think 
as we have transformed many of our parks, more and more people are just now coming to realize that parks are not amenities, but critical infrastructure like schools and sewers and electricity, and that public health, social equity, economic opportunity, and environmental resilience depend on their welfare. We need to spend much more on not just capital improvements for a few pocket parks, but on mid-sized parks like St. Mary's in the South Bronx and Betsy Head in Brownsville, on larger ones like Flushing Meadows Corona Park in Queens, which serve millions. And we need to devote far more resources to maintenance so as to maintain and expand the permanent staff of gardeners, plumbers, and security guards who keep our parks in shape. We need to redo the whole parks department, its procurement system, staffing, and administration. At the same time, we need to go beyond the issue of pedestrian deaths in the city. Traffic engineers have taken as their mission for decades to improve the flow of traffic and provide parking, but I would guess that many older New Yorkers who continue to view the streets as places to park and drive cars are not seeing the, th the city the same way younger New Yorkers are, who take the view that streets should be radically redesigned for pedestrians, bikes, and buses, not for private cars. I wonder, in regard to city streets, if this isn't a moment like the late 1950s and early 60s, when shibboleths about highways, cities, and housing policies shaped public policy. They were gospel for architects and engineers. But then along came iconoclasts like Jane Jacobs to point out that maybe we need to turn those long-standing policies on their head. I was struck walking down 80th Street, and I end here, um, from the Museum of Natural History on Sunday afternoon, that swarms of pedestrians had to squeeze single file along narrow, broken sidewalks while the empty street provided four lanes for moving traffic, of which there was none, and parked cars. Clearly, our priorities got screwed up somewhere along the way, and they are ripe for reevaluation. Syrian camps and the West Bank may not be 80th Street and Columbus Avenue, but, and I show you here Madison uh, Square, redesigned as a public plaza. My point is that if people in those places can make where they live and the spaces they occupy something new, we can too. Thank you.